a few popular objections for you since sure. we're on cosmology yes, I want to hear. Giving such uh, long answers here. Uh, yeah. So if God caused the universe, what caused God? Oh, I love that uh, objection. Um, I would start to answer that in the following way. Every metaphysical system or every worldview has to affirm something as the prime reality or the ground of all being or the thing from which everything else came. In every every system of thought, mm -hmm. there is what worldview scholars call a, a prime reality or an answer to the prime reality question, what more formally trained analytical philosophers call the question of ontology. Um, and if the, the if uh, the, you know the the materialists think they have a kind of a gotcha question or question or op, you know, who who caused God or who designed the designer, um, but you can turn that around just as easily and say, um, you know, if the origin of life is produced by the first simple replicator, wh what was the replicator that produced the replicator? I mean, you can always mm. do the what be what came before that trick, okay? The question, the, the real issue is. Um, what is a good candidate? What's the best candidate to be that eternal self-existent thing that is affirmed in every system of thought? Is matter or our matter and energy or our matter, mm. energy, space, and time the best candidate to be the thing from which everything else came? Or is it a transcendent creative intelligence? God. Mm. And I think in light of the cosmology, the developments in astrophysics, astronomy, and theoretical physics over the last 100, 100 years, all of which are pointing to a beginning to the physical universe of matter, space, time, and energy, that matter, space, time, and energy, or the material world, is a poor candidate to be the thing from which everything else came. Because mm -hmm. again, it has not been from eternity past. It began a finite time ago suggesting the need for something else external to itself as the ground of all being. And insofar as theism posits an agent or entity separate from the physical world that is eternal and self-existent, that has the quality of timelessness, the great I am that I am in Exodus, um, hmm. I think it provides a better explanation of the origin of the universe and the ground of all being than does materialism. Hmm. All right, Steve. And this... Actually, this is an, an oh. illustration of where the IBE framework or way of reasoning provides some utility in addressing questions like this. If we just have to answer the question, well, who, who made God? Well, that's a hard question to answer, but it's okay. also a hard question to answer um, if matter existed from eternity, what existed before that? I mean, you can ask, ask the exact same question. Mm. You know, but, but if both theism and classical materialism affirm an eternal self-existent something, you can ask of both somethings what came before that. Sure. But the real question, so yes, you could do that, and that may be unanswerable, but insofar as in all systems of thought, we presuppose something as the ground of all being, as the thing from which everything else comes, then we now have a way of asking which posited something provides a better explanation of the facts we see around us in the world. And I think theism does that. Gotcha. The Bible that makes... is also, interestingly, okay. I'm, a, I'm not just a theist, a biblical Christian, yeah. the Bible is interesting in what it affirms. It affirms that that Yahweh, hmm. and apologies to Jewish friends, but the name that's, that God uses in the Old Testament of himself is actually an affirmation of his eternal timeless being. I, I am that I am. So that's an interesting, the way God presents himself to mankind is as that eternal self-existent thing that hmm. neither had a beginning nor will have an end, and which hmm. is the ground of all being. Now, we're also told in the Bible that understanding that is very hard. It, it says in Ecclesiastes that God has written eternity on their hearts, but they can compre comprehend it not. That's why I have trouble with Bill's ac arguments against actual infinites. <laughs> sure, <know>? sure. <laughs> but but uh, in any case, there's a kind of realism, I think, a philosophical realism about the Bible 
in that the things that it affirms as primary or foundational, uh, the, the character of God or the limits of human reasoning are really true to our experience, or tr in one case, true to our experience in, this, in the sense of um, that it does, in the description of our li intellectual limitations, but also philosophically intriguing in that the way God is described in the Bible is in terms of attributes that would be necessary to account for existence. Mm. An eternal self-existent entity that could have brought the physical universe into existence a finite time ago. It has the necessary attribute of transcendence or separateness from the physical universe that would allow it to function as a cause of the universe as a whole. All right, Steve, isn't this an example of the God of the gaps where we may be lacking a scientific explanation and you're just inserting God in something? If we did that in the past in science, think of all the things we would fail to understand. So is this a God of the gaps and a science stopper or not? Uh, no. And many people will, uh, I think, be tempted after my last answer to stand up and say, Yes, obviously it is. Stop the God of the gapsing. But let me let me let me uh, take that on too. Um, God of the gaps is another way of expressing the uh, claim that someone has made an informal um, ar an argument from ignorance, which is an in a fallacy in informal logic. And arguments from ignorance have the same the, the following logical form. Cause A is not sufficient to produce effect X. Okay. Well, therefore, cause B did it. Mm. it. That's fallacious because we didn't offer any independent reasons for thinking that cause B could produce effect X. A God of the gaps argument is just an inform is an informal the informal fallacy of an argument from ignorance where the cause invoked is God rather than A or B or fire or water or whatever the other physical cause might be. So so I say, um, uh, well, let's start actually with intelligent design. I ma made the argument that um, neither chance nor physical chemical necessity nor the combination of the two can produce the information necessary to produce the first mm -hmm. living cell. But I, but I argue we do know of a cause which is known to have the power to produce that effect, specified information. And that cause is intelligence. So among those four types of causes, Got it chance, necessity, the combination of the two, and intelligence. Intelligence is the only known cause with the requisite powers to produce the effect in question. Hmm. So when I infer to intelligent design as a cause of the information necessary to produce the first living cell, I'm not arguing from ignorance. Yep. I'm not arguing from a gap in our knowledge. I'm actually arguing or inferring based on our knowledge of the cause and effect structure of the world. I've seen agents produce that type of effect in other situations, and therefore I have grounds for positing intelligence as a causal explanation in relation to this other relevantly similar fact. Or in a case of specified complexity or specified mm. information, identical kind of fact. So that's not an argument from ignorance. And it's an argument from knowledge, the knowledge, our knowledge of cause and effect and the knowledge of the effect that has to be explained. Now, people say, OK, but that's just for intelligent design. But what if you're saying that the designer is God, as you do in your new book? Mm. Well, in the new book, I also point out that in science, we often make judgments about causal adequacy based not only on direct observation of one type of cause producing a, a given type of effect, but we will also make judgments of causal adequacy based on seeing what relevantly similar entities are capable of producing and or on the basis of a theoretical analysis of the attributes of a postulated entity. The guys that were looking for the evidence of the Higgs boson 
or of mm -hmm. the first quarks had never they had no they had no prior experience of quarks producing certain types of effects or Higgs the Higgs particle producing a certain type of but they had theoretical understanding of the attributes of those entities and based on relevantly similar experience with other similar entities, we're able to generate empirical expectations or predictions of what they should see those entities producing under given circumstances. And that same side, uh, sort of uh, move, uh, move, which is a move of, of extrapolation, can be used to generate expectations about what you would ought to see, mm. what you ought to see if God were if there were a god acting to create the universe as opposed to a an undirected material process being the only thing in play richard dawkins himself has acknowledged the testability of such metaphysical hypotheses he says that the universe has exactly the properties we should expect if at mm. bottom there is no purpose no design nothing but blind pitiless indifference the blind pitiless pitiless indifference is his shorthand for materialism undirected material processes. So he's saying my materialistic metaphysical hypothesis has been confirmed by the things I, the properties mm. I see in the universe. And I think that's a lovely framing for a discussion <laughs> because I wanna say, is that true? Materialist, did you expect the universe to have a beginning? Did you expect it to be exquisitely finely tuned from the beginning? Did you expect the digital information present in cells or the complex digital information storage transmission and processing system inside cells. Two summers ago, Dawkins himself admitted to being knocked sideways with wonder at the complexity of the digital processing system wow. or information processing system inside the cell when he saw it animated by an Australian group who did an animation mm. of, the, of DNA replication. So I would say that metaphysical hypotheses are testable in the same way scientific ones are by comparing the expectations they generate with the observations we make of the world and the observable, the expectations for observations that they generate with the actual observations we make. Mm -hmm. And I think theism has passed those tests in ways that materialism as a worldview has not. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's one point. The other is that we have a relevantly similar um, experience with other agents, namely human agents, that'll, that allow us to know something about the kind of things that agents do that undirected material processes don't. And that allows us to generate expectations of the kinds of things we should see agents producing, or conversely, that the type of causal powers that we might reasonably ascribe to God as a person, entity, or even as a theoretical entity. If we mm. want to posit God, the God hypothesis, there are certain sorts of things we, attributes and causal powers we could reasonably ascribe to such an entity, and that would generate testable or ob observable consequences that either may or may not come true. So I don't think it's a God of the gaps. I think, again, mm. our knowledge of what sort of things God might do are grounded in many other in many sources of information. One of those might be scripture, but uh, also in our knowledge of relevantly similar entities, namely human agents and what we do. Hmm.